Hey, I'm Warren Sprouse here on the Bible Forum. This is Sunday, January 14, 2018. We're in our Sunday sermon segment of the show. We're looking at Colossians chapter 1. This is the third in the series, uh, trying to help you understand something of what the Apostle Paul was trying to communicate there to the Colossians 2,000 years ago. By way of introduction, you, you do know there was a time when Africa as a continent was called the Dark Continent. It was not called the Dark Continent because of the color of the skin of its inhabitants, but because the light of the gospel had not penetrated that continent. The people were living in religious, moral, and intellectual darkness. Slavery was common in Africa, between tribes, and even across oceans. Muslims were capturing Africans and selling them to the West as slaves. Muslims are still the largest slave traders in the world. In 1994, there were still an estimated 90,000 black Mauritanians in the possession of their Arab Berber masters. From 1983 to 2005, captured Southerners were frequently enslaved. The men were often shot. The children were made slaves, herding cattle, performing other unpaid tasks, while the women became the sexual slaves of their owners. In 1986, more than 200,000 people of the Dinka tribe are estimated to have been enslaved in a complex network of buyers, sellers, and middlemen with many of the slaves brutally treated and some forcibly converted to Islam. In 2006, a militant Islamic group stole children from, the, from Punjab Christian villages. The children aged between 6 and 12 were held in unspeakable conditions, beaten, barely fed, and forbidden to talk, play, or pray before being sold for approximately $1,700 apiece into the sex trade or into domestic servitude. In the 19th century, a man by the name of David Livingston was swallowed up by this continent as he searched for the headwaters of the Nile River. Livingstone is remembered not for that, but for his anti-slavery and evangelistic zeal throughout Central Africa. Seeing the sheer poverty of soul and spirit, Livingston spent the rest of his life in Africa, cut off from European civilization, helping these folks learn how to better their circumstance. Wherever Livingstone went, improvements followed. It is said native men carried his severed head, hundreds of miles to the coast after he died to give it to his European family and friends. His body was buried with honor in Africa. History records that wherever the light of the gospel goes, the lives of the people are ultimately bettered. Education follows, along with self-respect, Biblical values change lives, families, cultures. Today, upwards of 75% of the world is still living in spiritual darkness. It is from this darkness that the gospel of Christ delivers all people. You see, the prince of the power of the air controls the world. The Bible clearly describes the spiritual structure of these princes. Princes, and there are human princes, there were princes of Israel as well as princes of other nations. But there are also spiritual princes. You read about them in Daniel, the prince of Persia, the prince of Grecia. And the heads of these evil princes is a being, we are told, to call Satan, the prince of this world. 
the God of this world, the prince of the power of the air. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 5, we read of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the prince of the kings of this earth. Daniel 8, 25, prince of princes. This is Jesus. The point here is there is an authority structure, an authority structure that's operating on a spiritual plane constituting a spiritual battle, a battle for the souls of men. It is God who made man. It is God who made woman. In so doing, he created the basic social structure of humanity. The prince of princes reinforced that structure. The prince of darkness seeks to destroy that structure. And the world is quite willing to ignore reality in order to do this. Why? Well, John told us in 1 John chapter 5, verse 19, that the whole world lieth in wickedness. And it used to be that people would argue against that concept, but today we just need to read the news. In those days, you didn't have much news. People got newspapers. They were usually regional. You didn't get a much about the world, a section. Television came along in the 1950s, and there were news programs. There were two of them, John Cameron Swayze and Douglas Edwards. One was on channel, well, one was on CBS, and the other was NBC, and they were on for 15 minutes every evening. Today we have the internet, and sadly we have people who are telling us things with no authority and no background and no, no reliability that we take as gospel because we read it in a tweet. The darkness that's in view here is spiritual wickedness. From the words that we use to the attitudes we express to the moral carelessness and disregard for human life. Think abortion, street violence, domestic violence, random and senseless violence. All of these stem from a soul that is cut off from God. The Bible declares it. The news outlets confirm it every day. How much of this darkness do you let into your life? Is the darkness that you play around with, tolerate, is it on a leash under your control? Do you know how much of it you can allow before it takes over your life? I have a news flash for you. Spiritual darkness is not manageable. It's not a puppy dog. Spiritual darkness flows from our lack of spiritual desire, our lack of spiritual zeal. It springs from our justification of sin. No, I didn't lie. Well, I told a little story, uh, you know. And, well, I don't use the Lord's name in vain, but, you know, every once in a while, a vulgarity. But it, it's not what the Bible condemns. We justify, and it feeds on our irresponsibility and selfishness. It's in that context, as it were, that the Apostle Paul prays. In Colossians chapter 1, beginning at verse 9, he prays that you, all y'all, ye is the word in the Old English, and it is a plural pronoun that all y'all might be filled with the knowledge of His will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. In order that ye might walk worthy of the Lord 
unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might, all power, according to his glorious power, unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. That's the prayer of the Apostle Paul to the Colossians as he is beginning to explain to them how all of this works. Are we filled with the knowledge of God? Do we know, do we understand God's will? Are we responding to that will in wisdom? The reality is the average Christian is not filled with the knowledge of God, not getting very much preaching in their churches, and they're not really reading a lot, studying a lot. If we do not understand, if we're not filled with the knowledge of God, how will we know what it is or who it is that God is and how he operates and what he's all about? We'll never understand him until we read and know about him. And then there comes the response to all of that. Not just, here's six steps, we pattern our children and they walk in these steps. Not just that, but in all wisdom, that you would be able to think outside the box, knowing those principles, you could apply them in a lot of different ways and know that you were doing right. To be filled with knowledge is not the same as simply knowing something. Children know they're not supposed to take things that don't belong to them. People know it's not good to run up credit card debt. God says, owe no man anything except love. Romans chapter 8. And yet American households owe, on average, upwards of $10,000 in credit card debt. Proving the point that knowing is not enough. God says not to marry outside the faith. Look at the divorce rate among professing Christians. Look at the burgeoning divorce rate among preachers. How about loading up on sugars and chemicals and empty calories? Anybody know that those things are not good practices? They're not good for you? Didn't anybody tell you that? You said, well, yeah, I know. knowing is not enough. Paul prays that we would have spiritual understanding. Yes, I need to know the facts. I need to know the... Uh, the issues that are at stake here. But I need to apply spiritual understanding to these things. With spiritual understanding, would you ever load up on any of those other things I just talked about? The answer is no, you wouldn't. But we're not, as Christians, we're not, largely, cultivating spiritual understanding. We're not working toward that goal. We may know some of the doctrines. We don't really know them all or know them fully. And the ones that we know have application. So we learn the doctrine, but we don't always apply the applications properly. We ignore many of them. And that in itself is a form of this darkness. The Bible teaches us that there is power in this darkness. It is the power to deceive. It is the power to enslave. It is the power to destroy. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 13, Paul wrote, It is God who delivered us from the power of darkness. Delivered is past tense. And so we have to look back to when that happened. And when that happened was when we were saved. 
when we were saved, we were released, no longer bound by that. It's one of the reasons you had a greater clarity regarding uh, sin and salvation and, and the things that you needed to know at that time. But after that moment, after that glorious high mountaintop experience, most of us descended the other side and got back down in the world where we used to be. But now we're saved. And we started going to church and we started singing hymns and we started reading our Bible. We started in, along the process. But that was largely all we did. And quite frankly, it wasn't enough. The Bible says for the Christian, walking in darkness is a choice. It isn't that way for the unsaved. They walk in darkness. The Christian can, if that's what they want to do. We do it by default. Jesus is the light. And if we walk in that light, if we walk in his spirit, Galatians 5.16, we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Why? Because all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not from the Father. It's from the world. 1 John 2.16 And if we walk in that light, as he, Jesus, is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. 1 John 1, 7. Walking in light is following God's word on whatever it is we think, do, or say. Do you see the value of knowing God's word? How do you walk in the light if you don't know what it is? How do you follow the Word of God if you don't know what the Word of God is teaching? We often tell new Christians to read through their Bible, and there are all sorts of ways to do that in a year's time. And some of us look at that and say, well, you know, that's just repetition. I'm reading it. Uh, after a while, I'm just reading it to say that I've read it. And I'm not really getting anything out of it, so there's no point to it. Well, we shouldn't be reading it to be reading it to say I've read it. But what if we are? Is there any value in that? Absolutely. Absolutely. One man likened it to pouring water through a sieve. And you can imagine what that looks like. And he says, you know, I'm not catching a whole lot of water, but I'm keeping the sieve clean. I have known older men, Christians all their lives, retired, I'm going to read through the Bible in a year. I'm just going to do that. Every day I'm going to read in the Bible. I've talked to some who told me that after a year, their wives told them they were different. After three years, they were Bible students. There was a bunch of stuff they didn't know and they wanted to know. Life has a way of keeping us so busy that we don't see and hear what God has for us. The world is dark. Jesus is shining the light. And we need to walk in that light. He delivered us from the power of darkness when we were saved. We're no longer bound by that. So we need to walk in the light. You're walking in the light? Ask your wife, your husband, ask your best friends. When you watch me, do you think of me as a Christian? You might be surprised. 